All right, so I just want to point to a few sections. Um, so again, we're reading the Aeonic Space Time section uh, 5 2. And to begin with, there's a footnote on the first page, on page 179. In um, the big footnote at the bottom, footnote 20, you mentioned this word, Uberweg. Um, um, or, I'm sorry, Orbewegung. Maybe it's an Uberweg as well. But um, this Orbewegung, this primordial motion. This is, this is such a, a cool handle for what we're talking about. And um, it refers back to chapter three um, broadly. And so I went back to chapter three. And of course, that's where the section lies, the um, ontological dynamic. Yes. And it's a, it's a very fundamental concept, of course. It's um, preliminary to a few really important sections as well. So the section itself is, is very short. But um, that's just because it's, you know, it's beginning there. So the ontological dynamic on page 69 is section 3.3. And immediately after that is passing time, which of course is intimately related to what we're talking about today. And then after that, it's also fundamental to the modes of nature and further the hyletic and pneumatic substantiality. So these modes of nature, these forms of substantiality, have their basis in this orb this primordial motion. Um, but the word itself is kind of reminiscent of the categories we saw towards the end of last chapter in, in this famous diagram. It's, it's a primordial, you know, category. And it's, it's fundamental, maybe even um, it's so constitutive. I don't even know if you could really place it in any of these locations in the same way, maybe centrally or in a, in a similar way to, you know, because it's it's kind of like something that is fundamentally dynamic, right? It's it's a it's a movement. So it's um, it kind of transcends these polarities in a way. And yet it's a primordial thing. And uh, a similar such entity is a category like God or, or something like that. Um, or the spirit. And, and these can be distinguished in a number of ways in a number of different thinkers. But for Conrad Martius, um, these things are very closely connected. Um, and they're connected to um, these fundamental categories in the philosophies of Plato and Aristotle. Of course, the, um, what, what she refers to as Aristotle's fundamental concept is this um, world periphery. And of course the analogous uh, thing, and maybe it's to be distinguished from the prime mover in, in some way, or maybe it's to be identified with it. I'm, that's not my question at this moment. I, that is a question I have, but um, what I'm getting at is to draw the connection between this and um, Plato's demiurge. You know, these are, these are a little different maybe, but they're also very similar certainly in respect to everything sublunary, everything in the, the constituted cosmos. So um, so anyway, the, on the first page there, page 179, there's that footnote and there's that word, or bewegung in footnote 20. So that got me thinking about these things. And there's another section um, a few pages later on page 184 to 185, um, where, some of these polarities that we've already encountered in previous chapters um, are tied together in a nice way in, in a little sentence here. So spanning uh, 184 to 185, the sentence world spirit and world soul are the further descriptions for world periphery and world center. And in the, um, the two paragraphs before that and in the paragraphs after that, so this whole section here, you know, has a lot of these um, polarities. And if you look at in the appendix, the, um, you know, the table of contents for her um, metaphysics of the earthly, you see that it's structured in terms of these polarities. And, the, and these pol polarities correspond to the diagram, right? Some of these are exactly these categories. There's like a, a twofold of 
um, which one is this? Ma material potencies and then the twofold of uh, formal potencies. And they're all like or something, you know, primordial category. So I just felt like this was um, very elucidating, you know, this, this sentence and this section tying all of these key terms, you know, technical ideas in the philosophy of Conrad Martius together in a symmetrical, systematic sort of way. So I just wanted us to like bear in mind as we proceed that that beauty, that symmetry of the, the system that she's proposing. I, I do have another question. There's another point um, that I, I marked in here as well. Um, I'll just mention it real quick. On page uh, 183, we're talking about the continuous discontinuity or discontinuous continuity, however you slice it, um, that is expressed here in De Zeit 1954, but is also um, there in 1927-28 De Zeit. Um, but there, there's uh, page 183 seems to be indicating there's an, an important difference. Um, in the 1927-28, it's about the creatio ex nihilo going from das nichts, the nothing, you know, into being, and then back into the nothing. And this is like analogous to the, the motion of time, but also other things. So it's a fundamental ontological thing that then applies in the case of space and of time and other things like forms of substantiality. But then in 1954, the same kind of structure or the same kind of schematic, um, you know, is going from the aeonic potentiality. So it's not just the, at, at one point you call it pure potentiality, which is, I don't know, maybe the potential, 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 or one of these kinds of formulations, um, but rather the aeonic potential into, um, the, the the passing time and then back to the aeon when that is no longer now you know so things like pass through this this standing now so anyway th there's the structure that's the same but the category of aeonisha realm site einheit is new in 1954. Oh, yeah. so i mean that's just like something and it, it's tied to certain certain sentences in here that that we should probably look at carefully read together you know and think about even more in depth and talk about um but i just wanted to point to these see i just put like three little little thingies in in there to um make sure i bring these up so i just wanted to like you know be up front with that and uh you know get it get it going <laughs> yeah well that's um before we uh, all got here, I was saying to Randy uh, that I was reminded uh, in reading this section over for the first time in 50 years, uh, uh, how I got into this uh, this business of, uh, of Conrad Marx's uh, kind of um, phenomenological hyphen the theological cosmology and the uh, it, uh, I, and I was reminded of so many different things. I'm just going to share them briefly with you because I think uh, it might, it, if you understand, it might help you to try and grasp these things and pursue them yourselves because I think the issue, uh, if you see it more in an existential context rather than the abstract theoretical cosmological concerns, although the important as these are, you might understand how a, a young person could be taken up with this. Uh, of course, I was interested in realism. Who's not interested in realism? Even idealists are interested in reality, you know? So it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's uh, uh, silly to say, you know, if you're not interested in the real, uh, it's not interested in truth. Uh, but the, uh, what struck me uh, uh, was that the, uh, as a as a young re religious person who just had left a religious order in about 1967, and for whom religion was terribly important, and I always think of my religiosity as very close to the question of death. 
and and the uh, uh, I'm I'm I was I'm drawn into the the good news that death isn't the final word, and and that the uh, and yet we're reminded of death, uh, in especially in analysis like Conrad Marx's, but of course for Heidegger we're beings toward death, but Conrad Marx's made me. And of course, her wonderful appropriation of the uh, text from T.S. Eliot uh, that uh, uh, made me think of the whole issue of temporality. And we're living on the, uh, 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 the knife edge, as it were, being and nothingness uh, with this kind of analysis. And that uh, is a, and it's a very rich topic to think of how a being is tied to the now. Uh, tied to the present. And for us, it's tied, tied to a present presence or a presence that's pre presented and made now. Mm -hmm. And death somehow is the, the dark blackness. Not only the dark blackness, we look at it prior to its happening and reflect on it, of course, uh, we see it as it's, everything that we cherish is gone and irretrievably gone. And, and the, uh, the horror of the nothingness that death brings uh, is only assuaged in the modern version of secularism where we have to perceive ourselves as reduced to less than forms of spiritual forms of consciousness. And that we are, you know, at a fundamentally different than molecules of water or of any, any molecule. And so we're, if we're homogeneous with nature in that sense, then death doesn't pose a problem. But as other people, you know, many people pointed out, only human beings seem to be concerned about death and even have a knowledge of death in the sense of it informing their lives. Well, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the 1960s, eight, uh, and sure, and I, I was in Munich, and uh, I decided to do this dissertation because my mentor and friend Tom Prufer was a friend of Conrad Marx's. And uh, so, he, he, if he said somebody was good, I automatically knew that she was good because he was really good. And uh, in the '60s, uh, what's what was going on in in all throughout at the, where out at the University of Chicago, where I had been prior to Munich, and certainly in Munich, was this what we refer to with some sort of Im implied rich uh, meaning, the 60s. And what the 60s meant in, uh, for I think most of us at that time, we used new age kind of language. It's, and it's kind of interesting to insert into Conrad Marcy's cosmology of history. Just as I want to, before I forget, we're in the new, we're in the Anthropocene age with the climate crisis, which I think I want to make sure we don't let slip our minds when we're thinking about Conrad Marcy's. This is a, a, an, an unanticipated, uh, it's properly uh, unanticipated, uh, uh, age of humanity and the and the earth, because it's laden with the possibility of the end of history, uh, and in some sense the end of the earth as we know it in our anthropocene age, and anthrop and prior to that age. I want to come back to that, but. What we have then in, in the 60s, what was going on in, in my circles in Munich at any rate, well, I, I for one was very fascinated with the, uh, a great uh, Jewish Marxist philosopher by the name of Ernst Bloch. It's also the name of a famous composer and, uh, and uh, did again the uh, music, uh, uh, director of music, an orchestra director. But Ernst Bloch wrote a famous book, which was like an encyclopedia of, of daydreams and hope and, and reveries in which the present, whatever the present was throughout history was placed in the light of a better present. And in the background and horizon of his uh, reflections was always the theme of a 
uh, insurpassable better future, an absolute future of goodness. And this was the basis for utopian thinking. And that was the main uh, analysis he had. The utopian thinking was kind of like a human existential, just as for Heidegger, you know, anxiety was. And, uh, and the, the other categories of, uh, of, uh, of Heidegger were formative of being human. They were never without this kind of impulse. Well, the, uh, the, in the 60s then, you had experiments with all kinds of new forms of living. And you also had, a, you'd also challenged, there was a challenge around of what was the normative form, especially if it, if it doomed us to a kind of pessimism, a kind of uh, self-destructiveness or a kind of, of uh, lack of enthusiasm for the possibilities of life. And, and Ernst Bloch, then, in this wonderful book, it's, it's been translated, it's called The Principle of Hope, the Principe Hofnum, uh, is a kind of an encyclopedia, as I mentioned, of daydreams, among other things. But it would say the whole, the utopian principle in human life. I mean, it's, you know, and it's what it echoed to me now because <clears throat> I live in south central Indiana, and just a little further south from me, there is New Harmony. I don't know if you ever heard of New Harmony, Indiana, but that is a, that Sally has, it's a, a, a little town uh, that is, has, among other things, the ashes of, of uh, Robert Owen, one of the first and most uh, well-known utopian experiments in, uh, in American uh, history. And a, a, per, a person whose uh, uh, work I admired enormously, uh, and uh, whose uh, who's, uh, uh, lectures I got to hear a few just before he died actually at Chicago, Paul Tillich are scattered there because he, he, he died just before, not because I arrived there, I, 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 I hope, but the, uh, he, uh, he held with Eliada, my other teacher, this is kind of important too, Mertia Eliada at Chicago. I had other good teachers, but I'm just singling them out. Uh, Eliada, I uh, thought was uh, soaked with what uh, Bloch would call a utopia, or Tillich would call utopia. Tillich got thrown, had to leave Germany because of his critique of Nazism based on his own analysis of a completely different version of human nature, which had a utopian bent, you know. Uh, the, uh, but to go back to, uh, to the uh, <clears throat> Eliade, you know, Eliade, it was a, a, a offered a, a, the, the metaphysics of what we call indigenous people today, or in those days was called primitive people and aborigines. Hmm? But he found in all, in all the, their mythic structures, a kind of ontology. And if you looked at it, it's it, uh, the Abrahamic religions can tune into it very readily. The, the whole myth of paradise at the beginning, and then the, something like a fall or a, a loss of connection between heaven and earth then the struggle in between life and then the intervention of the gods through, through cult. And so the gods were made somehow present in, in, in cult. And then you had <laughs> the hope for the uh, happy hunting ground, the, the, the other versions of heaven. So Eliade will just show this is, this is part of the existential of being human, uh, religion was and his understanding of it, but the utopian impulse was there as an existential. Sally, did you want to say something? I've got so many questions, but when you were first talking about this, I immediately went to the 1830s because I don't want to digress, but I've read a little bit deeply into the Romanticism mm -hmm. era. And the big deal then was this fear of a flood. And it almost mirrors our concern these days about the environment anyway. The second thing is this, I don't want to, Am I confused here? I thought that Eliade got discredited because somehow he, you know, with his kind of oblique mm -hmm. uh, affinity for Nazism or something like that, or am I confusing him with somebody else? Because I think, I mean, I, I love Eliade, okay? But I, oh, I, I thought he's- I, I knew him quite well. He was, he ran scared of, of, of uh, socialism as any Eastern European you might, known who was submitted to forms of Stalinism. 
He's got a novel. He's, Eliot is a great novelist. And uh, Notre Dame translated his Le Forêt en Perdie, The Forbidden Forest, which I really heartily recommend for almost all of his themes. Uh, but I don't know that, Stally, that he, that he was, an, an, I don't think he was. Well, I only came across this recently and I was shocked. I mean, I was reading something and it was saying how he's been discredited and all this stuff. And I just found Where it so he, hard to beat because he's yeah. such a giant. Yeah, so that he's a giant for me too. And, and he got discredited by uh, someone, I think his name was Jonathan Smith, who was a pretty well-known younger, ver new, newer generation of historian of religion. And they, they went after him on details of particular religions. And, and, that, and then therefore also went after him because he was a, a Eastern Orthodox in his own background. And they, a, a, they uh, 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 claimed that he laminated on top of the Aborigine religions his own pro prejudices. Now that's the kind of discredit. I don't think that's true. I'm not a, I'm not a nitty to gritty scholar in this matter, but I can see that there's a form of what I would call secularism or a form of, you know, of, of, of dominant agnosticism, which when, when historians get a hold of a, of a person making historical claims, as in say the, 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 the Jesus seminar or the, the historical Jesus issues, you know, any claim that John and Paul would have to be ruled out because they, you know, what do they know? They're, they, they clearly were, you know, Gnostics or something else. And, and what they had to say about Jesus, you have to go to Mark. And even more important, you have to go to Urquelle, the source which founds Mark. And then we only know, only we historians know what that is because only we have, you know, found out uh, discrepancies and so forth. But that's, I'm, I'm exaggerating and caricaturing, you know, uh, 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 forms of uh, uh, biblical scholarship, which I despise. But uh, I, I think that they, they, they think that these texts, you know, is, uh, can be read without faith or anything like a religious impulse. And only a pure historian who's an atheist can best read these texts. And I think you'll find that same temptation in, say, of uh, who was telling me about it. And oh, my, my friend John Moraldo just wrote a history of Zen. And, and the same thing's happening with the uh, modern readers of Zen. Uh, that the, the origins of Zen are, are totally, you know, in, uh, deflated or uh, evaporated of any meaningful existential religious significance in favor of the historical version of, uh, of what's going on. So uh, just, uh, so I don't know about that. Uh, I don't, I, I know that he was, I was a little uh, irritated almost one time when I expressed uh, uh, enthusiasm for uh, a form of democratic socialism uh, when we chatted. Uh, but uh, I don't know anybody who, and I, a friend of mine, or who was a friend of his, another Romanian also, and he and I also, I ruffled his feathers. You know. So what Romanians experienced vis-a-vis, -vis, what we would call Stalinism, is uh, it's, it's, it was hell for them, you know, especially intellectuals. But I don't, I, I, fascism, I think he would have saw through fascism, he would have seen it as a, another myth, you know, uh, which would rob people of, of, of their dignity. So I can't, I have trouble believing that. If I come across it again, I'll, I'll send it Let to you. Let me know, yeah. I yeah. was shocked, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm I, I saw that on the Wikipedia page and looked into it a little bit. And um, what I made of it was that when he was back in Europe, he was maybe friends or somewhat sympathetic with some pretty conservative writers. And maybe sort of like some things they had to say or something like that. Yeah. Nowhere near Heidegger's connection to Nazism. Yeah. At least looking into it a little bit, oh, yeah. that's yeah. the most that I saw. And I think what you're pointing out, Jim, amongst a lot of contemporary historians, I agree, there's almost this over eagerness to deflate, you know, mm. to puncture a reputation. Yeah. And that goes on so much. Yep. And I, I agree that's it's deplorable the way that happens, you know. Yeah. So, and so and people get this idea he's been discredited. Well, by who? What have they yeah, really yeah. claimed? Yeah. But that it happens in this sort of collective conscious. Oh, oh, now we know about him. Yeah. That is yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. That's precisely right. There's, there's one other set of very big general um relevant contexts for Conrad Martius that um are also at odds at points. And um, I, I've been checking out this book lately, René Guénon, 
the um he was yeah, he's associated here, with though. traditionalism and on his own he's a, a very powerful thinker as far as um the philosophia perennis goes mm -hmm. it's amazing um his philosophy all expressed in there but then um traditionalism can be sometimes connected with some uh interesting um areas that are uh, you know morally questionable here and there um, but here he takes on a very cranky attitude about Blavatsky and further um, theosophical syncretisms mm -hmm. like anthroposophy as a chapter on Steiner. Um, so anyway, I mean, this is just to show that at times there might be little conflicts and debates in these areas, like between Conrad Martius and the early realists and Husserl. These could even be reconciled in, in other ways, you know. Um, so anyway, that I, I just feel like um, it's important to keep in mind, like, like I, I wrote this early paper on perennialism and um, and its opposite, which is like foundationalism or contextualism or anti-perennialism, you know, and I feel like it's it's really important to keep in mind all the all the points and all the debates, you know, but anyway, I mean, I, I just I was just reading this now. So I feel like, you know, it's kind of what we're talking about. Well, I mean, isn't the elephant in the room when you get to going on and this whole movement of traditionalism, at least some people associated with that were outright fascists. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And, and the same thing with like this charge right. of Eliotta, you know, having like early career fascism. You know, I mean, he sounds like a nice guy from from Jim's um, experience. But I don't think but I, and I don't really know either. But from a little I looked into, I don't think that's fair to say that Eliado was one of those early fascists. Maybe right. um, he, some people he knew that he sort of liked or sort of was connected with in some way, might have been more far right or something. No. No, I right. think it's, it's no. so, yeah, that, no. I think. No. Uh, I think so, when, if you face the hell of Stalinism, it, most any alternative at that moment will look pretty damn good, you know. Uh, and uh, so, well, okay. what, Jim, I think you're referring to Kalinescu, and I yes. think he, what did, I mean, he had a pretty high opinion of Eliade, oh, as I recall. Oh, yeah. yeah he wrote pretty and, good, well on him, too. He wrote some articles on him, you know. Right, and he's a pretty well-known scholar from, he wrote about the, the, the Faces of Modernity. That's, yes. I think that's a quite, and I think he, it's a quite well-known book about modernity. Yeah. But he yeah. came from Romania, yeah. and he, Kalinescu, and he couldn't go back, yep. he told me, yep. just because oh, yeah. he stuck out too much and he wasn't welcome yep. back there. Exactly, yeah, yeah. He and I were hiking buddies. Uh, he's passed on now, but uh, uh, yeah. Okay, well, so the, I'll just go back to Ernst Bloch, but the, the other point is, that, just, I'll, I'll accelerate this now. Um, the, uh, the existential and Conor Marxist now is the time was a kind of uh, rounded out, brought in the possibility of looking at temporality not merely as as a, a, a condemnation to a horrible dark finitude, uh, which one is one way of reading Heidegger's sign soon told it a, a being towards death, and that's, that doesn't touch to just him either on that score, but it it. Uh, some people were taking it that way, and and uh, uh, much of the, the flavor of existentialism at the time, in some some respects, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Camus. I mean, there were there was kind of bleak bleak uh, flavors of, of existentialism, uh, and and Sartre too, of course. Uh, uh, but he was he was a rich thinker, which was not merely a nihilist, obviously, but there was a, a utopian impulse in, in Sartre too. But the, the point is that a bloke for me had a, had a way of going about it. And at the time, the, the realm of possibility was a major theme. And he went back even to the middle uh, era of Middle Ages and found uh, well, medieval, so what he called the, the Aristotelian Linke, the left-wing, uh, what he called the left-wing Aristotelians, who were mostly Muslims, I think, uh, for whom the realm of potency and real possibility, you know, was the driving force. The actualization of real possibility was the driving force of history and a way of talking about religion. And 
So this is along this 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 thing was uh, this these themes were uh, in our atmosphere in Munich in the sixties, and uh, and then that uh, and one at the same time simultaneously for me as a, as a Catholic and uh, uh, what is the themes of Tyre de Chardin. Uh, and and, and uh, Randy spoke of the Urbewegung. Well, for Tyard and and that uh, and that uh, uh, diagram, uh, uh, Randy uh, calls our attention to uh, that diagram. The Urbewegung for Tyard and that and for and for Conrad Marxius too. Uh, and and if you want, if you're having trouble with this notion of a, a movement where there's no movement in space. Think of a decision. That's the, in the or the, the decisive moments in your stream of consciousness are made up of will acts. Are they in time? Do they have moments? You know, it's it and there and, and there's, there's something analogous about them as movements. But is it in this what sense? Is you're not obviously moving in space. I'm just going to make a parenthesis of that, but I want to have you think about how you can have the spirit moves, but it, it's not a movement in space. It, it's, and its temporality, if it has temporality, is really odd. Well, yeah, I think that's a really good point. So you th if you think it's important to think about making a decision as not a process, we can think about pondering and trying to decide that takes time. But no. the very act of deciding. Yeah. No. If you think about what that really means, it really doesn't take any time at all. Right. It's, a right. sheer, it, it's something that's real that you do. No. It's one thing to ponder and no. try to decide, right. but to actually decide is something you do, and it takes no time whatsoever. It's right. utterly instantaneous, no. No. and I think that's the connection you're making. Yeah. Here's it's something that if it's alive, if it's if anything is real, if anything is alive, it's the very act of making up your mind at the moment you decide. No, no. no. But that, what, in, and instantaneous isn't quite the right word for it no. either, because no. no. nothing could be fuller, nothing no. could be no. more real. No. And it's, and what it the, the, what you're calling attention to is is it, this is a theme of Husserl's too. It's a theme of Louis Lavelle, the theme of uh, Husserl, that uh, a decision that he call, Husserl calls him a position taking act. That is, I don't know if that's too long or too short, but it's 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 uh, it's, it's, it's it's some some kind of motion in our lives in the direction of our lives, and so deciding to get married to so and so, you know or taking vows, your whole life for the rest of your life is playing out in time in that timeless moment. So but the point, our point here is to think about the Urbewegung. And there are other forms of Urbewegung rather than the existential quanta of the now. Hmm? But that is, that is, uh, and it's always, it's an ever, ever new beginning and it's an ever, ever returning death. Hmm? And the, and the, I, I, you know what, that would be, maybe I'm distracting, but that would be in the Urbevegu in Lavelle's or maybe even Aquinas' terms, that's the pure act. No. And so when we make a decision, we are participating no. in the no. pure act. Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, the, uh, the, but if we, that's, that's a, a, we reach a metaphysical position, but if we think of, however, we think of our lives in terms of temporality, how we play out those decisions, and we get a hold of the of, of the, uh, it's a very helpful notion of the stream of time, where time might be coming our future out of the future into the past, the flow. But it goes by us in the stream; it's lost forever. Hmm? Uh, I, I was uh, uh, I was so imp impacted by Conrad Marx's and Eliade uh, when I, when I uh, right after I wrote the, the uh, dissertation. I wrote my first two essays were first one was a, a cult mystery re, uh, revisited it was for a British, a, 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 I think a Benedictine journal uh, based on the writings of part of Elia and a, and this, uh, this Benedictine whose name is escapes me right now. But it, it, as a Catholic, when the moment of the mass, this is my body, this is my blood, aren't, where, this is, this is a showing that, for, as a condition of the possibility of being a faithful believer, Christian Catholic at this time, you are saying 
that that past of the Last Supper wasn't in passing time. Because it's repeated every day or every time there's a mass. Hmm? So there was a funny metaphysics I had allegiance to that I didn't even know about. How, there, how I was committed to a kind of temporality that wasn't in time or kind of momentous ontological event, which wasn't in time and events are temporal. And my other or second uh, essay was on the phenomenology of nostalgia. But that was done about 1971 or so. And that, and I, 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 uh, I, nostalgia is an existential for me. You know, that this, this, this sense in which, and this, it's, it's Eliade, his, his whole interpretation of uh, Aborigine religions is based on the, the, being drawn to the, the, the possibility of this as a metaphysics, is, being, is having had a nostalgic experience where something is over and done with. It's in an in, in re, irretrievable past, but somehow it's made present now in this moment of nostalgia. And in the present is, 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 the, is there's a presencing of a past which in fact never existed that way. And in fact, it contains all the hopes for the future. So okay, this, can, can I, can, Jim, can I say something about this? Sure. Because, because what you're seeing right now is what I've been doing for about two or three years. And um, it started with Heidegger a long time ago, and then with Iliada. Um, and this whole, I mean, when I'm reading his book, reading, um, I have them right here, um, Cosmos and whatever, and all those books, Cosmos oh, and yeah. History, and uh, the other one, Prof Sacred and Profane. Yes, I am hearing the entire time, even though he sort of discredits this a little bit, um, the entire time about the Eucharist. I am hearing this all on every single page. Oh, good. And, um, and, uh, and so what I've been thinking about, and, and even in their second discussion about nostalgia, this is what fascinates me, is because if you read Heidegger on temporal, temporalizing or time, it doesn't have any place for any of this. There's no place for this kind of temporality, none at all. Um, and the same I feel for Husserl too, even though Husserl may have aspects that I don't know nothing about. And so this whole notion of the repeatability of time, of the return um, of the Iliana talks about, and I, what I'm fascinating about, and I really, if you've written about this, I want to read about it because I know no one who's really talked about the phenomenology of this kind of temporal, 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 temporalizing, whatever you want to call the word. Um, I don't know anybody who's done it. I've looked for the papers and I can't okay, find anyone who's done it. I'm going to get you my two essays. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to probably photo. I don't, this was done before I knew what a computer was. Okay. Uh -huh. So, uh, but, uh, uh, but I, I can, I, I have, uh, I can access them. But anyhow, that's, that's, that's precisely what those are in a way, especially the uh, nostalgia one. But there was some, there, the, the cult mystery revisited is also, uh, uh, and that's in this Benedictine whose theory I kind of spring from, spring off from, uh, he seemed to have an inkling of, of the, the, the complex metaphysics of time that ritual involves. But Eli, that's what Eli, Eliot is about. I'm so delighted you, you know, you, that, I, that you found resonance in all that. So, okay. Well, all right. So we had, you have the, this, uh, Theme of Eric's book, and I'll wind this up, uh, I think, pretty quickly now. Um, so we're in the Anthropocene, Anthropocene age. You know that what that expression says? I'm not even saying it right, but you all, have, you all heard of that expression? Yeah, this is the age which for, for uh, people who do uh, to talk about history and prehistory and so forth, they've introduced this term because uh, Nature is no longer than functioning on its own independently of human agency. What we mean by nature and nature's behavior, nature's manifestation is soaked with human agency. We've mod and we've modified all sorts of patterns. But I think for the activists now, uh, Greta Thunberg, for example, you know, you could, she's a marvelous young prophet. Uh, she sees it better than most of us in terms of it, it being not only not a novel 
geological age, so to speak, or way of period a, a way of periodization of, of human history. But she sees it in a in the I think properly in the apocalyptic category of maybe the end. Uh, the uh, uh, a lot of the serious writers, you know, uh, talking about it. So if you could just magnify the images, say, of the forest fires in the West Coast, what happens when the water sea levels rise to all the coasts? But then you magnify that with continual re repetition of cycles that we can't control. So that, I find that, that challenging then to how to think about Conrad Marxius schema here. And I didn't have that interest back in 1960s, but now I'm, I'm moved to think about how stable is, are the structures, the fundamentals, let's give her, uh, you know, the, uh, right now we'll, we'll suspend our disbelief, but we'll, for, uh, about her basic principles. But if nature is something like this eonic world periphery at the foundation, to what extent can we change? These, 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 these processes. We're talking about not just the earth for her. Hmm? So this is, this is the question I have. Hmm? Uh, I, that it's, it's, it, 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 uh, thinking about nature, I, I think it's a mistake to get into an optimistic view, you can't change nature. Obviously we're able to change nature as we know it, but can, how far can it reach? And why, why it's important existentially is if the orb of Eagle, of her cosmology of history is harmonization. That, that makes it an existential issue. Harmonization is a term she uses occasionally, but it's Teilhard de Chardin's term, that all of, of natural creation is born, is headed towards, as it's telos, the, the actuality of human being and human consciousness. And this, in, in terms of its telos, is the Christification, the divinization through Christ of human consciousness. And that's the meaning of history. That's the Urbebewegung with its teleological aspect for, for Conrad Marxius. And, and if, if the Anthropocene age is the beginning of the end of humanity, which is not impossible in terms of the serious theories, we have a, a deep, wide, human, human, humanity-wide existential. Mm -hmm. So this is, I just throw this out, why today, uh, uh, aside from my being grateful for the, uh, the uh, welcoming again into my heart, uh, Ernst Bloch and Mertje Eliade and, and Conrad Marxius, and why I got, it. well, the thing is, she's pointing to, in, in, in the rest of this, this chapter, as, as, you, as you know, she's pointing to the, the meaning of, the, of, of creation, the natural creation is the new heaven and the new earth. That's the meaning of harmonization. The glorified resurrected Christ is the meaning of history. It meaning in the sense of the, the, the sin and, and, the, uh, and in both of the French and the Germans, it's not only meaning, but the drift, the telos, the direction. Hmm? And so okay. the, uh, so I, I think that the theme of, of Urbebegung understood not merely as the existential quanta, but as you mentioned, the funny kind of Bewegung where the direction of the cylinder, you know, it's, where is it, what, what's it up to? the full actualization of all the intellectual potencies realized in human and, and nature's existence. But it seems to me that what, what it comes to mind is the question you started with. Okay, I got all that, but what about death? How uh, does death fit into this? That's her, that she, I, and, I covered that. I thought that was a pretty good part of the, that chapter. She, she thinks that the, it, it cannot, we have to have a new version of you, and we don't have just a continuation, you know, as many most science science fiction versions of death are. It's it's it, you just don't die, but all of life continues. No, there have to the whole theme of the the nature of being human, the nature of the the 
the essence or the nature of human nature is has a has a different tell us than it's than the than the actual state of affairs now and that and and what the meaning of life is hmm, in terms of of is no longer connected with it look we have the other problem with nature we have all the in, in, in scientific theory seems to be built on it we have the whole theme of anomalies uh, all all of the laws of nature are random possibilities randomness seems at the heart of everything we have all the natural uh, uh, what what uh, Plato dealt with in the demiurge and 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 creation, the ananka, this kind of necessity where shit happens. You know the, 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 the so then she explicitly acknowledges that if we think of nature as it is now in the most fundamental sense, including the necessity of death, that this when she t is willing to entertain the idea of a new heaven and a new earth, she's mm -hmm. willing to entertain the idea which goes back to traditional Christianity, that this realm of necessities that seems to be final is not final. That's right, exactly. And she what... explicitly accepts that. Yes. And of course, Sokolowski talks about this too, about uh, in terms of creation and the, what he calls the Christian distinction, that's mm -hmm. things, that things that in one level are necessities are not necessarily necessities. No. No. Oh. And so, but then of course the, you know, it, it's not to it's not to minimize human suffering or no, no worldwide catastrophe. But in a sense, the world is coming to the end. end humanity is coming to the end. We already knew that. It might be fifty years from now. It might be ten thousand years from now. It might be a hundred thousand years from now. It might be a billion years from now. It's going to happen. No, we already knew that. No, but and she takes that into account. No. It, if if that's her position, no. Yeah. And what 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 the, the uh, what she makes is in uh, 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 terms of her periodization, her theological, philosophical periodization of nature, she says that creation the we we start to periodize the beginning of of history and the creation is not before the fall. It's from the fall on. That's. With the era of humanity as we know it is the is the disintegral nature, and then it's overcoming that that lack a lack of an, or loss of integrity, which is is salvation history or, or the cosmology of history. So, but the fullness of, of of creation is in this not only overcoming, but this Hegel says this aufhebung this raising to a new level. And so, the, as, you're, as you're absolutely right, what, there's, I, I think I discussed that in there, that the, the meaning of, of death, once you eliminate death, you don't, it's not as if you have a recognizable continuation of humanity. No, the elimination of this form of the, of the, of the uh, uh, loss of integrity of, of nature means you have a new kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of a, a heavenly nature, a heavenly earth. And so, that's why the um, so, uh, Rodney's uh, choice to put that last uh, text in there from a writing of the Metaphysique of Zeus was important because the, the heaven and earth are not juxtaposed. That they, the whole per sense of earth has to be measured by the heavenly. And this is really a super core issue when it comes to any form of spirituality or politics, when we talk about hope for the future or a theology of hope, do mm -hmm. we mean in that we can build a better world now? Or do we mean that this world is fundamentally corrupt and will eventually be replaced by a new one? No. And are these necessarily in conflict no. They do get confused a lot. And I That's think right. this is a very real issue, not just theoretically, for, but right. for people personally, when they think about almost everything. Could it be politics or religion or their own life? No, no. Well, I think that's right. And the, you, know, you have the so-called progressive and conservative kinds of points of view. And I think the error of, a, of progressivism is, is the error of most utopian experiments, which usually collapse pretty soon. Hmm? Uh, is uh, is to think, you know, that by the, by their experimentation they will enter in, and they on their own, 
there, there's a good, I forget the name of the woman wrote a wonderful book on utopian communities, but she showed most often they collapsed uh, when they were without any sense of transcendence. They had your, your communal life together, had to have belief in the, in the necessity of, of sacrificing or you know, uh, not effacing yourself, but to, to at least control yourself enough for the sake of others. And for that was a, for a transcendent goal. It was never, it was never imminent in the sense of uh, nearly realized, and it was never imminent in the sense of already realized. Mm -hmm. But the, the, those that didn't have, but those that have believed in a kind of, uh, of a proper eschatology, as in short, I could put it that way, that those experiments were more successful. They had more, greater legs, longer longevity. But I, I don't think we could take her to be a reactionary or you know, very conservative person who would say any attempts at the amelioration of human. After all, she wrote a book on the utopian dimension sutra. Hmm? The, the, uh, the, uh, all of the, uh, or something like the utopia und Menschen sutra. Anyhow, she wrote a critique of Nazism and the, uh, the genetic uh, kind of, that was another aspect of the Third Reich, that they had a gene theory of, 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 the, uh, of the non-Aryan. Hmm? And, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, and you wanted a pure race. If you, built, you, know, you bred a pure race, you'd be assured of a, of a, of a uh, there it is, utopia dimension sutra, I had it right. Okay, That's, uh, that was one known uh, lunge into uh, you to, uh, you know, a political activity. Uh, I think that I, that was written probably after, if, if, she wrote a, if she wrote it during the Third Reich, I'm sure she felt it during the Third Reich, but I don't think she got it published because she hid out as a very unknown uh, uh, lady selling fruit in the country, in her hinterlands of, of, of Bavaria. You know, that's where she wrote all these books. So anyhow, I've talked enough, guys. I, I, I'll be happy to answer anything that wasn't clear, but I just, I guess the big thing is that her establishing a view of nature that not only was, had harmonization as a urbevegel, but that a redefinite, it, it involved a rethinking of what human nature was once you saw what its potentialities were. That the potentialities of all of nature were capable of being actualized. In fact, that was their telos to be actualized in a version of humanity, which was in the not yet, to use Bloke's expression. And then that not yet is not just the world as we know it. Oh, no. That, oh, no. So he's, she's saying that the world as you know it, and not in the sense of society, but the whole physical universe as we know it. Yeah. It seems like she's, you're saying that she's saying these, this potential is something that we can already discern in this world that we live in, yeah. even though it's a potential for a world fundamentally different and other and beyond no. than this whole yeah. universe yeah. that we yeah. live in. Is that fair to say? Yeah. There, are, there, are, there are indications of the, of the, the, the sought for, the hope for not yet. Hmm? And this was Bloke's theme. Hmm? Bloke was interested in her. I heard from somebody who seemed to know about these things. He was interested in her writings because he no one writing at that time that, uh, that I know of and that Bloch apparently knew of was, was as preoccupied with the theme of potentiality, you know, and developing a robust theory of the actualization of potentialities of nature. Mm. So, but I think that that's, that the, the, the ciphers of the not yet, the ciphers, the indications of, of, the, of, the, of the, but of course, you know, that's, that's what, uh, Good people are, saints are. That's what geniuses are. That's what, that's what uh, you know. Natural beauty is, and so forth. These are all indications of something that which is, but but also they have a halo of the not yet, or the possibly better, you know. And that certainly was a, a the Bloch's phenomenology of hope, hmm? and of um, Lutheran theologian, Evangelische theologian uh, Jürgen Moltmann wrote a book on the theology of hope, working these themes out. Uh, about uh, 20 years after uh, Bloke's book appeared. So anyhow, I just wanted to kind of give you the, for me, the kind of existential backdrop 
of how I got into this lady and, and, uh, and why this, uh, the ionic world periphery, when seen in the light of some of these existential issues, I think looks less ar uh, arcane or you know, obscure. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wrestling with what it means to be human in a way. It's, it's a kind of existentialism where nature is not something as, as it is some of our, our Jeremy and, my, our, my, and myself, fondest writers like Louis Lavelle, it kind of evaporates, you know. It's, it's uh, but the, uh, <clears throat> And I think, and I think today it's so hard to read a philosopher for whom nature has no status, uh, given that all of life seems in peril, you know, by by nature's um, uh, unstable status. I'm being quiet now. I talk too much. I got to go to the doctor in a while too. I got to get beat up. <laughs> well, I have a question, <clears throat> not with what you just said. I want to get back to the text. And um, the one thing that kept um, coming up as I was reviewing this uh, section was this question that um, Jim introduces on page uh, 181, but as far as I can tell, never resolves. And that is the question about whether Conrad Martius has a notion of absolute time. And um, and so, um, so why do I want to bring this up? Because, um, well, we keep talking about space time. And of course, in, um, in general and in special relativity, um, there is no absolute time. In fact, there's no such thing as simultaneity. There's no such thing as now, uh, at least no absolute now. And so, let's see, I want to find the page. Um, we talk about here an absolute now. Where, pay, where is that? Um, anyway, but we, we can see that from the diagram. Um, and the diagram on page 182. And um, we have these um, actual now, um, and then a real time. And so, and um, at some point, which I may be able to find, um, Jim mentions that um, this actual now is not, um, is somehow or the prior to, um, that any, any now that, that space-time theory would talk about. Um, so anyway, so that's my question. It has to do with this idea of an actual now and then this real time, and I'm guessing this real time is where something like modern physics, space time, um, reality would show up. But no. The actual now is something else. Um, I hope I'm making myself so abundantly clear. <laughs> no, I think, but I think it's probably Jim's fault here. Uh, uh, You're going to blame Jim now. The, uh, uh, a N here, uh, you know, we have actual now, but uh, to encompass the meaning of that, if, if I remember what I what I was trying to do here, we had to have we yeah we had to exp we have to uh, think about and and I, I suggest that we might get help from from Aquinas. I think others might have said this too, but the. Uh, it's, it's so funny, we have some philosophers in the 20th century, 21st century now, uh, you know, use thought experiments for, for uh, uh, to make important philosophical points. Uh, um, Elliot, uh, my friend and uh, teacher in many ways here, uh, 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 Hector Neri Castaneda uh, uh, said, you know, uh, he talked about, I, I, it was important for him and for me that we, we, we say that when we set, refer to ourselves in the first person singular, uh, you know, that we, we have a kind of inerrancy about that. Uh, and that sounds crazy because we all know we're confused about everything. And, and, and Prasakris himself says, you know, the hardest thing to do is self-knowledge is self -knowledge and so forth and so on. And, uh, but uh, 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 Hector made the thought experiment he says, even the person who doesn't know who in the world he is, inherently refers to himself with I, you know. And 
And so uh, it's, it's best an example of a thought experiment that's helped me. But I doesn't mean me, Jim Hart, you know, the, the father of Yeti and uh, the Julia, uh, my wife, and so forth, but uh, retired from IU. That all could be gone. Hmm? And, and I don't know who, who in the world I am in that sense. But even if I, if I don't know any of that, I can still refer to myself inerrantly. Hmm? And that's interesting. Hmm? So, well, that's, we don't have to dwell on that thought experiment. Hmm? But for, for uh, the medievals, uh, th they used angels a lot for, uh, to illustrate in, in, uh, forms of knowledge that we didn't quite have access to, but could be conceived of as, as genuine, and, but also forms of temporality. And the angels existed in a time that didn't have the nunc fluens, the flowing now. Hmm? And this was partly due because of their natures were essentially unsterblich or immortale. They were essentially immortal. And so, uh, they, uh, so they lived in an aeonic time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and she is trying to, Whitehead has a, wrestles with the notion of aeonic time too. I, I think I might say that in there somewhere, but I, I remember that. But in any case, uh, I, well, I, Eliade would too. The, 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 the time of uh, 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 the time of uh, of Oedipus, and the time of uh, give me another Hercules. Hmm? Uh, Hercules, the deed, the time of his deed in in the Greek myths of his strength, manifestation of strength, weren't pa wasn't in passing time. Hercules is it in so far as Hercules exists, that time of his of his deeds never die. There's a there's a kind of timelessness to Hercules's life insofar as the deeds. That's what Eliad, Eliad talks about the time before time. The, the what? Time before time. Yeah, well, that 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 that, that certainty is is yeah, the mythic time, exactly. Exactly. And uh, that would be, of course, for the Abrahamic people of, of Abrahamic faith, that would be the, the, the narrative in the Genesis, hmm? uh, would be the time before time. Uh, it plays a much more prominent role in, in uh, the, the Aborigine or primitive so-called uh, uh, First Nation people, but uh, uh, that time doesn't pass, you know, it's, it's, it's just there. And so, so uh, Aquinas wanted to say of angels that they had a time in which it wasn't passing and nothing, that nothing was lost and their lives were all together at once. And that was a clue for her for two things or a, a, a suggestion, a thought experiment for how to think of the aeonic world periphery in terms of the essence of telekies, which were doing things, you know, always doing things. They were always in, in, in having, uh, being part of the Urbebegum, Urbebegum. But uh, it was, it was, uh, it was also a way to think about the, the uh, kind of time that was possible for human beings when death was overcome and that they, were, that they took on the new bodies, the new humanity, the new kind of hom harmonization in its fulfillment hmm? uh, would be in aeonic time. It wouldn't be the divine time, hmm? uh, but how it precisely differs on the divine time, she doesn't say because it, well, God's now is absolutely containing all perfections right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, all the archangels and uh, heavenly hosts and so forth, they, they all are finite. Mm -hmm. And their lives are, their eternal lives are all finite. Mm -hmm. And the perfection of their lives, although it's endlessly greater than ours, are still finite. I got to go, guys. Uh, uh, I look forward to uh, uh, hearing from Randy and let me know what, uh, what when we're meeting. I'll try and meet again. I, I seem to see have to see a doctor every day. So it's, so uh, when you get old, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, anyhow, uh, I'll see you soon. And thanks Thank for listening. Thank you so much. God bless. Bye thanks, bye. Jim. Bye bye. Thank you so much.
Well, so while Jim is um, closing up, up shop, um, we still see you. <laughs> oh, you do? It yeah. <laughs> oh, it's interesting. How's that? Oh, see, that's, I'm a techno idiot. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll try it again. How's that go? Lead meeting. So, um, so it, how about Sally, David, do you guys want to want to jump in? I feel like I'm still in the woods. I, this is what I'm just, I mean, I am extremely mathematically uh, challenged and so, but I'm trying, I, I'm very excited about this entire book because I feel like it's like a philosophical answer or a parallel or antis anticipates a lot of the things that I'm interested in over the course of the 20th century in terms of cultural, historical, you know, religious history developments. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm just like all over the map. I mean, I'm thinking Gebser, I'm thinking other yes. things like, does this come in, yeah. you know? And so I'm sorry, that's my contribution. I just- Yeah, yeah, no, well, I, I'm into Gebser. I, I see Gebser in this kind of system as well. And that there's another, um, there's another, uh, scale here between um, the passing time that we experience on earth and the the time of of the angels you know um oh uh g-e-b-s-e-r jean gebser his famous book the ever-present origin um certain editions of it have like really cool diagrams in the back as well about everything that that he's talking about Got my copy just right down and and he talks about mythic time um i you know, I'm I'm no expert at um, how to match Gebser with Eliada. Um, you know, I'm not sure. Like, I don't know if Sally, if you know, like exactly whether they agree on everything. But I mean, as philosophers who look at all of these figures, you know, we can figure out um, how they, you know, how they how they bear on the truth of the real situation. You know, and, and I also feel that like Hart's book here. Conrad Martius's philosophy is um, is is such a, a profound and untapped so far um, source for unifying so many disparate fields of inquiry. You know, um, so I mean, so I've been getting a lot just lately, just like towards the end of the summer, out of um, connecting this with what a lot of the anthroposophists and theosophists have to say. And um, I think an interesting contribution here is um, in, in the syncretism of theosophy, but you also find this in Eliada, the idea of circular time. Um, in many uh, Aboriginal cultures, in, in their um, anthropologies and cosmologies. Egyptian. Egyptian. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and Eliada, you know, um, even has like encyclopedic works that, that cover like each of these topics in really nice ways. But, um, you know, cyclical time appears in many different places. Oh, and also um, uh, Marie von Franz has this book, Time and Number, where she mentions Conrad Martius and Aeonic Space Time. Um, I'm not sure if she mentions Gebser, but she also mentions other figures in, in early phenomenology, like Dietrich Manka and um, his idea of the infinite sphere. Um, so, this idea of cyclical time, sometimes it's applied in the like Christian or occult, like Christian mystical, you know, um, Rosicrucian sort of sense. Um, but uh, sometimes it's also cast in in um, the uh, the multiplicity of Aboriginal cultures, like from the the Mayan, you know, time system um, to um, like in, in the Vedas and the Upanishads, and especially some of these syncretists, like in Theosophy, um, connects it with um, the Surya literature. I can't remember if it's a Shastra, Surya Shastra, or or what, um, or if it's certain Upanishadic literature. But um, there's this doctrine co cross culturally, just as there's a cross cultural interest in the sun, like solar worship, and placing the moon and the planets. In, in, um, in a kind of universal frame in, in both senses universal. 
Um, there's also this stuff that is sometimes called like the black sun or the sun at midnight or the dark sun or, or whatever. Um, sometimes it's connected with Helios. I think sometimes usually Helios just refers to the sun in the Mithraic stuff. But anyway, there, there's a different kind of um, like higher hidden sun occluded, eclipsed by um, the visible sun. And, and maybe you could argue that Plato is even talking about this in a way because of its presence in like Orphic and other, um, you know, religions around that time. Um, but th there's this universal presence of astronomy that um, that isn't just about the obvious relationship between the Earth and the sun, but also about um, the galaxy. And, th and this is really weird. Um, this is famously known by the, the handle of the Yuga system. So we're in the Kali Yuga. And, you know, Jim was uh, opening with this idea of the Anthropocene. And um, Husserl's crisis is very much tied to, I'm, I'm not going to say, I, I'm, I'm trying to stretch it a bit, um, but it, it may be that Husserl's book, The Crisis, is very much about, especially if you contextualize it with like Jean Gebser and, and these kind of figures, um, what's happening since like Descartes and then um, Nietzsche's madman declares the death of God, you know, we're like maybe getting into a Kali Yuga situation, you know, um, and the Anthropocene could be like the end or whatever, but it could also be that we're in the, the darkest part and it's getting darker, but it, it, the cyclical nature might um, be going back and we go through other Yugas to get back to that good one, the Satya Yuga. So, so in some of these systems, they talk about the real circular, you know, and um, and layered nature of cyclical time. And um, and what's interesting about tying it to the cosmos is you can actually insert contemporary astrophysics and check, you know, how it matches up. And it actually matches up um, so far in, in in what I'm finding. Um, pretty well. And it could just be that we there's a lot that we don't know still in contemporary astrophysics as well. So maybe there's a lot of room for imaginary connections. But um, but th there's, a, there's a period where we, we go around the, where our solar system goes around the, the galaxy, you know, the black hole in the center of the galaxy. And, um, and that period has a certain um, ratio in relation to the bob that it goes up and down as it goes around. And so that's the the yuga system it, it corresponds to these world ages and according to like the theosophists we're in the um each one is divided into seven and each one is further divided into seven and we're in like the fourth of the the fourth or something like that um anyway this is this is what i'm this is the framework i'm using to, to think about it <laughs> lately um, looking at theosophy and um, going on has this this whole book on on the timing of the yugas um you know there, there's so much interesting literature on on that kind of thing um but connecting it through someone like eliada you can definitely see these connections um but then like gebser you know these these uh, world ages are also corresponding to um states of consciousness like the, the mythic immersion the dominance of um mythic consciousness and then the the um the dominance of rational thought, you know. Um, one one problem I have with this whole hierarchization or whatever you want to call it of the Gebser theory. I mean, I'm I'm really interested, and in, I've been reading the book for several years. I go back to it, but is I just see historically speaking more circular kind of around and around we go in terms of human humans trying to make sense out of existence or whatever. And I mean, whereas I just see Gebser is more as this, this again, this teleologic kind of higher and higher consciousness till we get to perfection. And I mean, I just see that in a weird kind of a way, it's a battle between these two ideas of trying to make sense out of. Yeah, well, like in Empedocles and Parmenides, there's this idea that the, that this actus purus, for instance, this like perfection state, you know, um, of of pure the the truth of being is just this like perfectly homogeneous sphere, analogous to what's been called like the the block universe hypothesis, 
um, you know, like a solid universe or, or even nothing? Like, why is there something rather than nothing? Um, the way uh, Leibniz and, and Heidegger and others phrase it, you know, why not? It would be like most harmonious and most peaceful if there was simply nothing at all, or rather the opposite. If there was this transcendent concrete, for instance, you know, the block universe idea. Obviously, the universe is um, a bunch of stuff that happens. So it's in between these, you know, but um, but like, you know, I, I find with the, the like two kinds of time thesis, um, as certainly Eliada puts it, there's like the linear time and then there's circular time. That's one way of putting it. That's how Eliada often puts it. I mean, that's that's how a lot of people put it, you know, and um, certain narrative structures like um, especially the the like um, Christian narrative structure is sometimes um, you know very tightly connected with the the linearity of like the three world ages like um, whereas you know some some of these other ones that have room for like emanation uh, versus creation or reincarnation versus just going to heaven or hell you know, th there's a, a much more like circular system. And so we have to reconcile the, the like orthogonality of time with the, the circularity. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And this is why, again, I mean, I just have this feeling, I just have this sense um, that that Conrad Martius is, could be the answer. That's what I'm, I feel like. And I hate to use that expression as, as an academic. I was, say to my students, I really don't want to know how you feel. I want to know what you think, but anyway. Well, I mean, I guess we've, we've been in a digression. Maybe we should like try to really tie it to um, to sections here. I mean, it was only a few pages that we read this time. Um, are there certain locations anyone wants to point us to? Well, Randy, um, I think next to Jim, you're probably the one person most familiar with this. I mean, you've you've actually written on this. And I guess one sort of maybe more nuts and bolts question is, I'm still a little bit unclear about this, um, like the diagram with this with the with the cylinder and the disc, and just exactly even literally what the image is supposed to be. And I'm wondering if you could sort of give your account of that. Yeah. Of what is moving where? What's the cylinder? How is it moving? And what? I wonder if you could kind of sum that up from what you've been able to figure out so far. Well, can I say that was exactly the question that I was asking Jim just before he left. Because I still don't understand this. And I, it is a good translation, this word actual now. So I remember it was something actual yet or something like that. Yeah. But, so it's, it, that's a good translation. And um, I don't know what now means, especially in terms of this space time that we, that we get in uh, Einsteinian um, physics. Yeah, well, let's start with Aristotle. Um, in, well, you know, in could we visit. back up a little bit? Because yeah. I'm, I'd like to ask a, in a more almost pedestrian question, he, what in terms of just the literal image, of course, the point is these deeper questions, what do we mean by now? But even just the literal <laughs> image that he's using here in totally literal terms, I don't clearly see, even on that literal level, what the image is. There, what are the three circles? And how are they moving in relation to each other? Even on that totally liberal level, I'm confused. And I'm wondering if you could start out just by giving us your understanding of what's literally the image is. Just yeah. if you see what I'm asking. Yeah, so she conceives of it as being um, a four-dimensional continuum within which our world matrix. But if I'm talking about those yeah. circles, totally yeah. in a literal sense, there's a picture and there's there are three circles in the picture and what are they what are they supposed to represent literally what are they yeah. supposed to represent? that's yeah. so, it so yeah. so literally this is our world and you can think of it as like a window that's open maybe even um your eyeball that we look through or or even the earth itself right well, Randy, it, could you back up a little bit 
rather than yeah. saying what it all means, I'm asking literally to describe on a totally literal level what the image is supposed to be. Things, these circles are supposed to be moving. How are they moving? So, and how do they relate to Thank you. Auf Deutsch? No, no. <laughs> you, okay. see, you see what I'm asking? A yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Three or right. four steps, and just in the totally literal, what is the image supposed to be? Not even what it means, but what the structure of the image itself is. That itself is unclear. So I can't even understand what it means if I don't even understand what the image literally is. And do you see what I'm asking? Well, sort of. I mean, I have to. Okay, well, let me explain. Literal is a little I mean. heavy right here. Okay, now. the idea is that they're supposed to be cylinders, that the outermost circle is a cylinder, right? Or sort not? of. Okay, well, let, let's be clear. I mean, if so literally, in the sense of tying these words to their text and contextualizing okay, them with okay. the text, right? Um, the word cylinder does appear in Conrad Martius, and Jim pulls it over into English for us. So the cylinder, um, you know, this is something that you also find, in fact, in Einstein and others. Um, even Bergson has a similar sort Randy, of similar. Randy, please yeah. stop. What? I, I honestly feel like you're evading my question. Get away, Einstein. Don't go to anything else except this diagram. Yeah. And what is it literally supposed to be? Okay. On the most basic, absolutely simple, stupid level, what is supposed to be? What is supposed to um, Is it? Do you understand? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little impatient, but you see what I'm saying? You keep going off on all the connections. That's great. And we need to do that. Please bracket all the connections and just focus in on the starting point, literally, what this what is supposed to be literally happening just in a totally abstract level okay. geometrically. All right. I mean, I've I, I find it um, illustrated in my imagination from like sci-fi stuff that I've seen growing up. Um, the image in Donnie Darko, for instance. Red, that's not what Perhaps. I mean. That's I mean not I'm just trying I mean. to illustrate it. Get all that out. That's worth talking about. I mean, but what do you want? Just... I don't even understand Can what I... geometrically it's supposed to be. Yeah, Sally. Oh, well, I'm just piggybacking here. When it literally says underneath the image, just a second, it says, this is a model of the space-time union. Okay, where's space and where is time in that? What, what is the space and what is the time? I don't know if that even makes it worse, but that's when I, when. Okay, well, look, I'm in, I'm in space-time, you know, or anything. The Poland Spring water bottle, right, in phenomenology, this cup, it's in space-time, right? Yes, it's it's in a number of dimensions, but most readily it's in like three, right? Or maybe three plus one because it, it also moves along in three as and that's what, that's how we experience this plus one, this four number, right? So here's a three dimensional object, but it, it also exists in a fourth spatial dimension. Really, it's a fourth space time dimension. So this is an object in three dimensions, in four dimensions, you know, depending on how you want to talk about it. Um, and so the, the way we usually talk about it um, is it's this, this 3D thing, a stereometric volume, you know, specifically like 16 ounces of something, of substance. And it, it also like moves along that river of time. This image of like time is, is like a river. And we can't see that, that river. Right, but we can see the, the motion in a certain sense when we employ memory and anticipation, you know? So we can see it move around, not just in the third dimension because in each snapshot, it would be in the third dimension. But, you know, if we take it as we experience it, like we experience a melody, you know, a melody is nothing at any one instant where it's just a note, you know, there's all these silences that it's made of as well. So we got to take the whole thing as like a whole gestalt. So we have to look at it from like top down in addition to, I don't know, from the side with snapshots, right? So this is a three dimensional object, but it moves along the fourth dimension and we can barely see this fourth dimension because we have to like look at it in a totally different way than in terms of images, you know, that we can have snapshots of. So what she's proposing 
is that we can conceive of this fourth dimension in in a in a, a real way so that it's the next higher dimension opened up you know and it's she admits as well as do a number of other um, thinkers who use this kind of notion around that time including einstein that um you know it's it's a, an intuition that is alien to us for the most part but it's less alien than like the fifth or sixth dimension or something like that you know so is that fourth dimension here the ionic world periphery exactly so the fourth dimension is the ionic world periphery and then there's real time and i there the, the idea is there's the ionic world periphery which is sort of the place of potentialities and then the real and this world center is a sense of potentiality but more the um, but but a passive potentiality that which receives the potentiality is that, that sounds that sounds about right yeah and that in order for time to happen these two are somehow brought together okay, and, gonna, to I, and so yeah. that's what this is supposed to be symbolizing that the aeonic periphery in a sense is flowing and the world and the world time is in sense is flowing, but its flow is not simply the flow of time. It's more of the origin of time. The the, the world, which one? Sorry. The, the ionic periphery is constantly, in a sense, pouring potentiality into yeah, it's like a reality. moving cylinder. And so that so that so the AE that's the ionic periphery. It's rotating and that uh, going around. And the real time is also going around, rotating, and they're both touching the world. And um, perhaps, well, here I have a question here. Here's a question. Shouldn't the world really be represented by a point rather than a circle? Well, we have that as well here because that's the tangent point up here where the, the world touches the aeonic world periphery. So that's the 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 punctual now, right? right of, of the like. Yeah, but I'm saying, but I'm saying, but the, in this diagram, the W, the world, is a circle that has two tangents, with the inner circle and the outer circle. Here's or, a or a whole circle, a whole great circle around its diameter would be like, you know. So so if you want to think of it like a point, you can look at this as a two dimensional diagram, or if you want to think of it as something more than just a point, like a line, specifically um, a great circle of this sphere because it's a cylinder, right? So it's a cylinder that has a sphere in it. It's another way of looking at it. You know, just like this thing, you can look at it like it's a three-dimensional object when you just take a snapshot of it. That's analogous to looking at this diagram like it's, you know, a diagram on a two-dimensional sheet of paper. But of course, if you talk, if you use the word cylinder, then suddenly this thing can also be thought of not just as, a two-dimensional image on your screen or a three-dimensional like representation, right? Because you know it's three-dimensional, but maybe even a four-dimensional thing that has motion, cinematic effect, that's more than just a series of snapshots. Okay, well, here, here's, I don't want to belabor too much, but here's what I got so far. It kind of makes sense to me that this idea of the aeonic potentiality versus the the active versus the passive potentiality meeting, and those two essentially constitute the now. But if, but, but that's taken care of by a two-dimensional diagram. What if we were to think of this diagram as a slice of cylinders, and I guess you're saying the world is a sphere, what does that add to the meaning? Well, that's exactly what it's described as. The, the world slice or world disk you know, is one way of, of looking at this, this world. So we can kind of think of our world as being just a slice of something more. So I'm going to go back to Donnie Darko, but maybe we're not all familiar with this particular <laughs> cinematic phenomenon. Okay, just, just picture like a little action figure, right? Here, this hand. <laughs> like, so here's your little like doll, like little person action figure, right? Um, this, this hand here, you know, um, can can move along and be over here for a while. And get, you know, it, it can live this whole life. And one way of defining aeon is as lifetime. Sometimes in Heraclitus, the word aeon is translated lifetime. You know, um, in other words, the totality of the time allotted to that 
that entity, right? So here's here's this entity. Let's say it just pops into existence and then it, it goes over here and it pops out. Um, if you took like a, a time lapse, you know, you would see like this stretched out thing. And that stretching, that Erstreckung, is the, the cylinder of this, this thing stretching out. So if you look at it in terms of this world slice or world disk or home slice, maybe, um, you know, and stretch it out into the form of a cylinder, that's, that's the image. Okay, so it's just a way of visualizing something that cannot be visualized, but there are like, you know, these thought experiments that we can use to kind of imagine, like, like say you have a ball and it, it bounces across the screen. You can picture it, its trajectory. It, the ball is different than its trajectory, but in a way, you know, those were all real actual instances of that ball being in different places at different times. But if you were to like, you know, enter the fourth dimension or whatever, whatever that means, you know, you would have like the ball stretched out. The whole world would be like this, this mess of, of things everywhere. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be neat and tidy with like one object here and one object here. So, I mean, that's just like a thought experiment. You can kind of visualize the world as like having a bunch of these world lines showing their past and their future, these fates, you know? That's the Ananke that we were talking about before, this kind of fate. You know, Ananke rules over the fates in, in, the, uh, in the Republic, for instance. But I mean, that's just like one way of looking at it. So, I mean, the diagram, I feel um, one can wrap their head around. It's, it's, it's just a matter of taking your head and picturing it right here, just your, your disembodied head, your no neck head, right? And just wrapping it, the whole darn thing around and, and having this weird <laughs> head cylinder or cylinder of, of hair or hairlessness, whatever the case may be. Maybe some beard hair around the central peripheral um, part of the cylinder and, and, and no hair on the top. <laughs> uh, can I, uh, so I am still somewhat confused. So I think maybe contrary to what Jeremy just said, there actually are two times. There's this transcendental time, if you want to call it. And then this thing called real time. Real time is what is actualized in this world. And it's kind of like what the world produces an actualization. And all of physics is about real time. But the ionic periphery and the actual now is a, as far as we can tell from this picture, an independent time that also is um, somehow or other, um, I don't know how it's connected to real time, but it's connected to real time through the world apparently. Um, and, but, this, but this is its own, this is the kind of thing that you were talking about with the Uyghurs or whatever those things were. There is something that's not, that's sort of transcendent, we can't know about them. This other time, this ionic periphery, and um, but the only thing we can really know about is this real time, which we know about through the world. But the uh, ionic periphery is unknown to us and uh, maybe revealed only in Revelation or something. Well, just to really blow our minds, there's, <laughs> there's the pyric time or the, the real time. And then there's yeah. the ionic time. Maybe it's like this or maybe it's the whole darn cylinder. Right. But then. Here's another thing that she that is mentioned in this book, but is not brought to, to interface. There's there's yet another category, transnatural category, and that's the apyric space time, which has both a spatial aspect and a temporal aspect, just like the aeonic time has a spatial aspect and a temporal aspect. It's only in the, the pyric time or the real time that our intuitions have a unity of both the spatial and temporal aspects. So Here's this thing, right? And, and in my real life experience of it here and now, and in, in your basically real life experience of it through Zoom or YouTube, you know, um, you at home can see that there's this coffee cup and we all know a coffee cup, right? It's a three dimensional, a three plus one dimensional unity in intuition in space time. Boom, we all know it, right? And, um, and specifically that's the Einstein Minkowski Manifold, this three plus one-ness, you know, this three plus one dimensionality of things. 
that's the world we're familiar with the the daily work old uh, daily you know diurnal consciousness uh, world and um, there's there's like a four dimensional version of it that you can kind of visualize maybe by meditating on this diagram and thinking about how the coffee cup you know goes around you know I mean th these are just propedeutic didactic things you know that that help us imagine what it might be like but um taking the book what what conrad martius has to say at first on faith and and using um what recur calls sympathetic enactment in an in imagination when you read it trying to imagine what are these categories are there really like or materialis and, and like you know like the other diagram shows us like where would that be how could that be obviously not in the same way like the coffee cup world i think bill is asking a more basic question how do we know there is any such thing as the aeonic world periphery in the first place is it do we experience it in some way do we infer it is it simply an object of faith how do we know how is it present as such yeah i mean certain aspects of it are always going to be in this case, a model, a schematic, like a, a molecule, um, you know, being like a, a circle with little circles in it, or an atom having a certain structure where it's like, you know, a, a cloud of probability function, or 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 a, a Bohr, um, you know, model where it's like a bunch of circles. Well, right? I think it's best to, for me anyway, it's best to bracket out questions of science. And simply, because I don't think she's basing it entirely on that, even though she makes a connection. But I think there's a very, fun, this is, a, I think this is a really fundamental question about her whole, whole project, especially in relationship to phenomenology. Um, and Bill is, Bill is asking, I think this is, the, this is the core question he's actually asking, which I think is a core question. How do we even, we're, we're saying there's this fourth dimension and I want to bracket out Einstein completely for now, because I don't think it's necessary to it in any case, because it has to do with the very idea of potentiality, the reality of potentiality, the effect, efficacy of potentiality, the essential, this necessity of potentiality as a constitutive element of what you even mean by reality. That's, I, to me, that's the core question to hold on to that's whatever else we may think is is at is is at the heart of what she's exploring so, so um, how do we know that it exists do we so, experience it in some way directly so the way i um, feel and i'm really using that word important feel feel about this is that um, it has to do, and Stein picks up on this as well. And that is that, um, that for both Stein and um, Conrad Martius, the actuality has no being. Um, there's no such thing as an enduring actuality. The only thing that endures is potentiality. And so there has to be an enduring realm of potentiality. I don't know that that helps me, and I like the idea. It's really this Occam kind of idea that the world is passing out of existence moment for moment, and there has to be something that brings it back into existence uh, moment by moment. And that even though earlier in the text, Jim's text, he talks about the now is the only actual time, that actuality has no being itself. Um, it has to, that really it relies on something that transcends it, some sort of potentiality that, um, that has to always endure in order for there to be any actuality at all. Yeah, I, I think that's, for me, that's really useful. I mean, th is that a quote from Stein about potentiality? Uh, who knows? <laughs> I mean, both of her really metaphysical books, Act and Potency and Finite and Eternal Being, are so relevant here. In fact, yeah, she yeah. is specifically referring to De Zeit so much in Finite and Eternal Being and the categories that we've been talking about in Chapter 4 and um, that are 
now taking on this quality of um, describing a kind of transnatural, transtemporal type of time, you know, these are the categories of a kind of potentiality and actuality that are both like sub, you know, real existence as we think of it, and super, both above and below. There's there's a lot more than just what's present to us in in her system. You know, so so in these diagrams, like our world could be laid out like, you know, having this circle around it, but there might also be an even bigger circle somewhere else. And I don't know how you would put it on the, this diagram exactly, but that's how the apyric time and aeonic time and then pyric time or, you know, normal real time in the usual sense of real time um, would, would map onto each other. You know, Husserl in his lectures on inner time consciousness has a kind of two, there's like a, there's a fundamental twofold in there as well. Um, there's a two dimensionality to time and a double continuity that are the essential structures um, and, and can be seen in his diagrams also. And there's a kind of superimposition of real time on a transcendental framework. So I feel like there's, um, you know, uh, there's a, a task to like connect Husserl and Conrad Martius up on these points, as well as in the, the overall real ontological, um, you know, dynamism and, and other structures in their two ontologies. One thing that occurs to me is maybe it has something to do with the intuition of essences, which she, she does follow that idea in Husserl. And there's, isn't there something about the intuition of the essence of something that is inseparable from the intuition of potentiality? For something to be an essence, it must be a potential because if you intuit an essence as such, you're not just intuiting what happens to be right there before you present as an individual, you're introducing something which could be and could be many individuals. Isn't that one of the experiential roots of this whole idea of the ionic world periphery? Because we can at least reason to the point of saying, well, how is it that there are objects of certain kinds that develop in certain ways unless potentialities and essences inherently have some kind of efficacy and are not merely dead objects of thought. Right, right. And, and in fact, it's with the, with the genesis of these concepts in philosophy as philosophical concepts in respectively Plato and um, Aristotle, the essences and um, potentiality or entelechia um, that we have the original um, relationships that are here spelled out. So she's kind of just taking the Platonic Aristotelian essence of philosophy, um, you know, and, and sticking it in the, the contemporary modern context and um, starting her analyses like in Der Realm with, um, with a critique of Aristotle and of Kant and of the um, quantum and relativity theories and, um, and getting to this doctrine you know, that she's presenting of there being um, both essences that we can intuit with this phenomenological method and also um, ecstatic essences and other dynamisms happening between certain essences. And um, an, an ecstatic essence is, I think, a kind of way of um, describing an essence of existence. Because it's not just that essence and existence are you know, never, um, you know, they're on a continuum in some respect. And so if we, if we know that both of them like exist in some weird way, such that obviously existence exists and existence even exists in a very empirically verifiable way, you know, you can kick a stone and, and touch things, right? But um, essences are intuitions of reason. So um, both of these must, exist in a way. So there is a, conti a continuity there. And um, the idea that some essences 
have an essential property of being ecstatic or beyond themselves or participating in the circle of the different or whatever. Um, you know, the heteron proteron or the allo chi allo, um, th these kinds of phrases you find in, in Plato. Um, you know, it, it kind of um, gives you the philosophy of Aristotle. So there's a kind of way of harmonizing Plato and Aristotle um, that you also find in, you know, um, Neoplatonic Aristotelian philosophy and in, you know, all these like uh, Christian, you know, thinkers who come later in, into our, this tradition. And uh, I, I feel like she's just like kind of spelling it out. So a lot of this is in the air and she's just, you know, giving voice to the, to the, the air, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but it occurs to me, you mentioned, you know, Plato's Demiurge, which is a sort of perhaps mythic story, but isn't it approaching a really crucial issue in Platonism? He says that beings only have being and only have order and rationality by participating in the forms. How does that happen? How do real beings in the visible world participate in the forms? And then he says, well, there's this demiurge, which is sort of like this God or world spirit that both looks up at the forms and then looks down into this, it's called the hupodoche or the receptacle, which is, he doesn't really define and tries to shape the world in its receptacle, despite its resistance, as much as possible to correspond to the forms. And so that's the whole idea of how essences become realized in like concrete reality. And so I think what you're saying, and I think this is what is going on, uh, is that's the issue that's behind all this. And if you think, and the Plato's story of the Demiurge is much simpler, and it's a, but perhaps that's a quite helpful image to bear in mind as a kind of story that maybe if we keep this in mind, it'll help us get through all of the incredibly complicated and intertwined you know, ways that she tries to, I think, as you just mentioned, she tries to work it out in detail. Is that kind of, is that kind of what you're thinking too? Yeah, the, the hermeneutic imperative of demythologization, um, especially in this book, we, we have find this, these analyses of Rudolf Bultmann, um, but also in, in the philosophy of the hermeneutics of Paul Ricoeur and uh, in Eliade. You know, it's all about taking these intuitions out of their um, embodiments, you know, and, and that's what you're doing in these um, syncretisms. Um, that's what Eliade is doing, Rene Guénon. You know, um, and, is, and the, is the Timaeus really a myth, or is it? You know, I think that's not entirely clear. Well, it's an icosmos. It it's just to be a kind of story, or whether the demiurge really is God, or something like God, or a world spirit. Um, and th this is what Whitehead bases his whole metaphysics on. Yeah, I mean, so um, just to bring us back to that point I mentioned earlier. Um, on it's on page, or it's especially between pages 184 and 185 that Hart, following Conrad Martius, starts tying together all these different polar structures, all these ideas that we've been enacting, in, in um, uh, interacting with the the mass hule on the one hand, you know, and the etheric on the other hand, you know, in the the context of the, the discussions of physics from last chapter. Okay, is one of them. The spiritual and the material, the light and matter, these are all at the top of 184. You know, there's like a list of all these uh, right about here, all these polarities. Um, and, you know, we're supposed to try to fit them into some idea of the world periphery and world center. And how do we do that? Well, th there's, we have like all these schematic tools. We have this, right, where you have um, all of these these opposites interacting in all these different ways. 
Um, and these are terms pulled straight out of the, the metaphysics of the earthly, which we have a bit of in the appendix. Um, and we also have all these, these structures that we discussed in, in chapter four in the anthropological reflections and earlier in, in the discussions of, um, you know, the, the role of entelechia in, um, in evolution, right? And here, they're also connected to these Platonic and Aristotelian concepts, especially Aristotle is present here, the idea of the, um, the world periphery, he says is like the, the world spirit and the world soul is like the world center in this, in this little line that spans the two pages. Uh, world spirit and world soul are the further descriptions for world periphery and world center. Um, so, I mean, it'd be cool to like make, it'd be cool if, if Jim wrote a, a third volume or something today, you know, and um, I, I feel like we could put all of these elements together. Maybe we should have like a website where we start um, building this diagram, maybe maybe a three-dimensional diagram or something, <laughs> you know, um, but we should build this structure so we can start moving away from um, such abstract schematics as these diagrams that we have so far to something that that moves around like like one of these, you know, one of these things, a um, what do you call it, an armillary sphere or whatever, you know, because that, that's kind of the image you get in Timaeus. There's this um, this sphere, this perfect sphere that the demiurge is looking at as a model. That's the original, and it's creating the world based on this perfection of the sphere. So the world's not perfect. It's you know an icon or a you know a reflection, an image of the original. So that's called the sphere of the paradigm in the original Greek, and then the the world is an image of that. So he says that this story is an ikos muthos, and usually that's translated like a likely story. And um, you know this has different like semantic resonances, but um, you can also look at it like the schematic that's being presented in Timaeus is already um, is actually giving us an iconic logic, which is a specific branch of logic that, that like what you see is what you get, like a Venn diagram. You know, at the intersection of the two bigger circles. Um, that stuff is definitely having both properties. You know, this is this is a kind of iconic logic. Um, so anyway, there's like a real like tight analytic way of looking at what's being described in Timaeus schematically that we um, usually take, you know, and just kind of like imagine what this could be. And what we get is sufficient. We get an image of the world as a sphere and it has a circle of the same which is the um, the cosmic equator. So that's this here, this is a circle of the same. And then it has the zodiac or the ecliptic, which is all different, right? The planets move differently than all the stars move. So that's the basic schematic in the Timaeus. And then there's other cool schematics, right? All the, um, the tetrahedra that, that compose all the elements that the world is made of. Um, but those tetrahedra also fit into this image of originating in relation to the center and the periphery, or maybe these other two, um, the, the world, um, you know, um, the circle of the same and the circle of the different, sometimes called the sphere of the same, because it all moves, you know, in the certain same way, all the stars move like this, whereas the planets wrap around like this and they move differently. And in their difference, um, these two spheres uh, reveal something about the heavens. In their difference, they open a disclosure space of the true nature of our place in the cosmos. So I think that that's kind of what we want to find in Conrad Martius is a kind of a, a beautiful myth that can um, open up the cosmos for us in ways that it starts opening here and there in the sciences, in other myths, you know, but um, but she, I think she's tapping into something that is very specifically philosophical, meaning very much tied to Plato and Aristotle, but in a very deep way, and is um, is painting this this picture of of higher and lower realms, you know, and maybe the the like theoretical physics idea of like a fourth spatial dimension and a fifth and and so on, or Kaluza-Klein string theory with its 
12 or 26 dimensions, et cetera, you know, maybe these all contribute something to that. But, you know, there's, um, there's a lot here and it, it's spelled out in, in terms of, um, you know, the, the constitution of the world and its different kinds of substantiality. I mean, this is all novel, it's all new. This is totally a unique perspective, you know, except maybe like in Edith Stein, you get something similar, of course. I would like to, um, the things you were just saying, Randy, um, introduce this question I've been having about Comrade Martius and Aristotle for that matter for quite some time. And that is the origin of accidents. Um, so, and so the demiurge, as, as you described it, uh, attempts to um, indicate um, how, how accidents occur somehow or other, some sort of imperfect mm, transcription or something. I'm not sure what Aristotle would say. But I mean, and so this, of course, um, falls in line with, with accidents. We can introduce evil. And of course, in the Middle Ages, there was the whole, the sublunar, which was um, the earth, <laughs> um, and where there's the fall and the corruption, and dating back to notions of decay, which follows on, I'm, I'm following my train of thought, following on the Iliada and the necessity for the, wor the world grows weary, and so it needs renewing. Um, and then, of course, in modern physics, we have introduced uh, chance, random, which, which um, brings us back to the no ancient notion of the um, order out of chaos, and that the order is continually decaying and going back into chaos. I just, I'm just seeing here um, a, a picture that's been around probably since the beginning of man's begin of thinkings um, that seems to follow. And, and the whole issue has to do with this notion of accidents or evil or something like that. Well, there's an interesting discussion on page 152, in fact, in the section on apyric hymen space, um, both about the demiurge and this chaos, this chaotic time before the demiurge formed the world, um, that I think is definitely worth looking at because we're talking about it here on, on page 152 in terms of the actualizing essence entelechies. This is back in chapter four, where there's a lot of discussion of that kind of thing. And also the um, the world peripheral entelechies. So this is a kind of um, uh, what do you call that? A uh, a hint of what's to come in the chapter that we're dealing with now in in the section five two. Um, I can't remember where it is exactly, but it says that um, what we were doing in the previous chapters was dealing with these entelechial and mass hyletic substantialities of individual things, individual objects. And now what we're doing is we're doing the same thing, but talking about the total cosmos, having these realms. I'm reading into it a bit, but that's that's what it's indicating. There's some line in, in our reading uh, for today that's about that. Um, as far as like, you know, the, uh, th th there's a really interesting term. If you if you Google it, it's a, it's not a very well known term. Um, solar apex or um, apogalacticon and uh, perigalacticon are positions that the sun and the solar system have in relation to the galaxy. And so this this ties it to the the yuga system that I was referring to earlier. And um, barring all of religion and myth for a moment. If you just look up like solar apex and see where we lie on the bob as we go up and down and around the galaxy, um, there are some theories out there. That they just pop up on Google for, you know, when you, when you, uh, when you look, I noticed the other day um, about how when we're far out away from the galactic plane, um, this affects life such that it's possible that Maybe even all multicellular life might um, fail in some or every <laughs> important respect, um, just being so far away from um, all these these forces in the, in the center. And this is just in like reductive, you know, po contemporary positive scientific astrophysical terms. 
and and you know and this involves biology as well of course but um there's some theories out there about this and it's interesting because that's what all these myths have been saying <laughs> you know i mean i don't think they're going so far out as to say that like when we're out here it's the apocalypse you know and and we're when things start looking better is when we're like heading back to the center and then once we leave the center we're sad again until we hit um the what's called um ant apex the solar ant apex which is the opposite of um the coming apex so they they say we're like we're nearing apex and i i asked them recently some of these astrophysical communities you know where exactly are we in this 62 million year up and down motion um so hopefully we'll find out soon well, they have some 62, I think it's it's 62 something. And then going around the galaxy is something like 100, no, I don't know. I don't know, you can Google this stuff. It's, it's really not important. <laughs> Before we I, go, there is one more yeah. question I yeah. wanted to ask about the text. Because it, and I'm probably reading this wrong, but it fascinated me. And it's right there on page 182 which he talks, um, Jim is talking about trans-temporal time is certainly discussed by Conrad Martius in sight as an extension or stretching outward. Um, and so I don't want to read the whole section, but you can look at it. And so I have a question. My sense of what Jim is saying here is that Conrad Martius is saying that space itself and time itself aren't real, in quotes, things, what it is is that there are sort of entities, if that makes any sense, what that is. Um, they um, have this attribute or something that's part of their essence is to have space around them. And the same with time. It's like they are, in other words, the only reason we have space and time is because we have spatial and temporal entities. And um, and so I only remark that this is similar to the revolution that took place in general relativity, in which forces and space and time become, um, um, what's not the word? It's the derivative of objects, in as much as objects warp space and time and create their own space and time. So I don't know if I'm misreading this entirely, but is that what Conrad Martius is saying. You're saying that in relativity, um, the object is the paradigm. Yes. And then the notions of space and time are like images or echoes of these objects. Yes, sort of like, yeah. They generate, they warp space and time and sort of in some sense generate their own kind of space and time. Anyway, that may, that may, that, that analogy may not be as, as good as I would like. But the point is, it does seem to me that, that Jim is saying, that Conrad Martius is saying that space and time are derivative of essences of entities, I don't know what to call them, um, and that they're really without these entities. That, in other words, there's no such thing as empty space, nothing, nothing like that. That would be another way to say it. If there's nothing in it, there's no space. Yeah, I mean, the very idea of a pyric space time is weird because how could it be a space time if it's a pyron so a pyron means the infinite right the unbounded specifically in the greek the unbounded the proper yes, so, context right. is an axiomander and you know thales yeah. because an axiomander was was a student of his and and so maybe it's like the oceanic you know idea in in thales which then has mythic precedence and um and, and then, you know, so if you go into all of this context, you get a better sense of what the Greeks had for this idea of the infinite and their relation to it. Um, and, and so that, that paints a picture of what is meant by a pyron. Now, of course, Conrad Martius doesn't have to like just be ascribing um, this ancient archaic Greek idea to contemporary metaphysics. It, it's, it's not that she's like just pulling Aristotle and Plato and the ancients and plugging them in here or or the the medievals or um or even uh, you know she talks about the weltmaya and eastern philosophical terms 
she's not just pulling all of it together, but she's pulling the essence of all these things together and building a kind of um, a refined, you know, ultimate systematics, it's called, you know, that, that's her architecture, her architectonic system, her metaphysics, you know, and so in this system, it has these categories like the infinite and the infinite space time. This has its genesis in her notion of, um, bye Sally. <laughs> um, I'm so um, sorry. No, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, Heisenberg. Heisenberg talks about this um, unendlich unendlichkeit, infinite, infinite. You know, th there's this planetism in Heisenberg. Um, so she has this this concept that has its genesis in her interpretation of this, this category coming from, from Heisenberg in Der Realm. But, um, but, you know, Heisenberg also waxes philosophical, you know, and he, he talks about the infinite in terms of like a, a kind of physical manifestation, you know, in terms of these, um, these potencies. So in some respects, it's not so different from these fundamental categories for Heisenberg. Um, you know, but she's bringing them all together. So the image that she's painting, and, and now this is me, you know, is that there's this, this world periphery that is, um, in the case of aeonic space-time, an image still of something even bigger, a bigger periphery, a bigger world periphery of a pyric space-time. So the infinite space-time is this, this um, you know, hupodoke, for instance, you know, this ultimate trogger, in her philosophy, this container, um, you know, but, it, you know, and so, so one can critique the idea of like, you know, a container or that space, Cora is like a container, you know, people have, there's a, there's a long tradition of critiquing Plato's Timaeus in, in this way. Um, so it's not that she's just pulling that out, but she's pulling something essential out of that, you know, so, so for me, the idea of the infinite sphere is the best way of understanding what this ultimate, um, you know, this category of the ultimate, as, as Whitehead puts it when he describes God, this category of the infinite is, um, is like a, an infinite sphere. God is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and periphery is nowhere. And there you have this formulation in the pseudo hermetic idea of the infinite sphere that's so famously echoed by Pascal and, and so many others you know, of um, a relation between a very weird kind of world center and a very weird kind of world periphery, you know, and a very weird kind of sphere that is no sphere, you know, like an infinite dimensional sphere. So I just, I just see with her like system of these trans-dimensional, trans-natural categories of, of space-time, you know, a, a very good way of understanding like how, how to synthesize all this stuff from all these different areas. Okay, what are we gonna do next time? So I think that um, we're geared up to continue into the cosmology of history. Jim was already talking about it a bit. Um, so I think that that next section being the last in this chapter, also setting us up for the next chapter in a nice way um, will be our assignment. So specifically that is um, from pages 187 to 201, not too painful. And we're um, also looking at about two weeks from now, which is October 8. Hope that works. Um, you know, I'll, I'll send out an email. We'll have a look. But that's, that's basically the plan. Okie doke. All right. Well, have a good one. You too. Thank you guys. Uh, God bless. Bye bye.